Hi, welcome back to season four of Qubytes, your bite-sized pieces of quantum computing. My name is Rene from Valorum Reply, and today we're going to talk about quantum and machine learning for image classification, which is a super exciting topic with a lot of growth in the market at the moment. And I'm honored to have a special expert guest today, Dr. Johannes Oberreuter. Hi, Johannes, and welcome back to the show. How are you today? Hi, René. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here and I'm feeling great. Looking forward to talking about this exciting topic. Awesome. Um, a couple of folks might actually remember you from a previous episode where we already chatted about quantum computing. But for the rest of our viewers today, uh, can you share a little bit about your background uh, as it relates to quantum computing? Yes, happy to. So um, I'm, I've been working for a couple of years now for Reply um, as a machine learning expert. And uh, on top, I'm co-leading uh, Reply's global practice on quantum computing. Um, I've been trained as a physicist, I've done a PhD, and then I've had two postdoctoral assignments uh, in quantum many-body systems. So I've looked at the research side of things. And now I'm uh, very excited that this is the age where quantum computers quantum computers are becoming a reality. So this is really an interesting point in time. Absolutely. And now you're putting the, the research to work, if you will, right? So exactly. That's, yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, so let's dive into our today's topic. And can you tell us what, first of all, what is image classification and how is quantum machine learning related to image classification? Yes, so image classification, um, as the task says, it concerns images. You want to have a computer look at images and put them into various classes. So that could be, I mean, the classic example is you have a bunch of images with cats, a bunch of images with dogs, and maybe a car. And then you want to say, uh, well, this is an image where which shows a dog. This is an image which shows a cat. This is an image which shows a car. Um, or so a hot dog. Or a hot dog, exactly. <laughs> it could be all kinds of things. So... Um, Obviously, this, this, this is an easy task for humans, right? Uh, you, you don't need a lot of training. Um, you, you know what a cat and what a dog is and what a hot dog is. Um, but uh, for a computer, that's, that has been very difficult for a long time. Um, but it can become interesting if uh, you want to look at a lot of images, like at a video stream or think about a production facility. You might have a, a camera looking at your product, uh, a car, say, and you want to see, is there any damage in the, in the product? And that is something which you would like to automate. So um, a couple of years ago, um, people in the machine learning community came up with a technology which is called a convolutional neural network. So it's a, it's a neural network and it tries to really emulate the way in which uh, we think that humans are perceiving images. So it tries to really look at, at spatial correlation. So there are the eyes and there is pointy ears and there are whiskers underneath the eyes. So that's probably a cat. And if it has a, a tail and which is wiggling, then it's probably a dog. And so, I mean, so it tries to, to come up with these, these characteristic features of, mm -hmm. um, of various um, classes of various objects on an image. Um, so with, with these um Convolutional neural networks, in a way, image classification, image analysis can be regarded as a solved problem. So we, we know how to do it. We know how, how, um, how this works. However, um, like in these scientific challenges, which people have been looking at, um, we have millions of, uh, of data available, millions of data, which people have been sitting down and labeling for the purpose of the advance of science, which is great. But in everyday life, uh, this is costly. This is expensive. You mm -hmm. don't have these kind of um, these kind of resources to to look at millions of data. You might not even have a million of of pictures of a damaged car. Uh, hopefully, you don't because it would be super expensive. So, um, th this is a real problem in in this in in uh, bringing this to um, to an active uh, a real a real use case in in practice. And um, what people have shown is that quantum computing can help for neural networks to train faster, to train, to need less training data. And that, that's, of course, super interesting because th these, these models are super data hungry. Um, and it's, it's great if we can uh, reduce uh, this amount. So this could be an application where uh, quantum computing or quantum assisted machine learning um, can help. So um, now it's, it's quite interesting because the um, the, the like this this uh, this extraction of features like eyes whiskers pointy ears that is something which these neural networks are super good at doing so uh, you need loads of computational power for this uh, a lot of memory you need to put the whole image in memory um, so this is something where quantum computers are really struggling we don't have these these size of machines um, but you can use uh, after these these features have been extracted from the, from the images you can use 
um, quantum bytes, quantum computers to create a better representation uh, of these features. And that is helping us in, um, in getting better uh, classification results with less image data. So you can, you can train your network in, uh, for a good prediction with requiring less training data, which is a huge benefit. Of course, which is a huge like benefit you, for business in a business like, context yes because like you were saying it's it's very expensive if you have all these data annotation the data labeling and all of that it's a lot of manual labor these days right <laughs> And, and very often you need uh, you need really skilled people to do this. Um, mm. It's not like cats and dogs, which we, where you would say, okay, give it to a bunch of school kids and everybody can do it, and you can you can super parallelize it in a business setting. That would be uh, or, or think about medicine, for instance. You could do image yeah. classification for medicine. So you need a doctor sitting there and saying, mm. well, I guess this is um, there. I see a shadow on the lung. This might be a hint at uh, at some some disease. Um, that's super complicated. You need highly yeah. skilled labor and and. And sometimes you don't even have that available. You cannot just ask a doctor who is in working in the hospital and say, can, can you please take four weeks off to do some data labeling for me? So that, that's sometimes really difficult. Yeah. And uh, healthcare is a fantastic example because there's amazing progress actually already being seen with these kind of image classification or exactly. let's say AI in healthcare, a, a, a big, big kind of growing field uh, with amazing results. I just recently came across a, a new paper uh, where they are trained a neural network to detect certain skin cancer in its early stage. And they were able to outperform humans yes. by, you know, finding, okay, is this cell going to be dangerous? Is it be is it going to be a cardiogenic, basically? Exactly. And they can detect it way, way earlier before some most like professional doctors could see it. And of course, they had to, you know, most of the research was, of course, getting the data, right? Like, like you said, the model architectures are done. They are there. Basically, of course, you need to fine tune then for these specific cases. But like for this specific case, the training data is the huge effort, of course. But it's Absolutely. worth it. I mean, yeah. they can help a lot. This has a huge impact, right? And so exactly. if we can... I mean, I mean, uh, if, if you think about the impact that this, uh, it's something which you can even do at home, right? You point your yes. iPhone or your your camera at uh, at your at the um, um, the spot on your skin, yeah. and it will give you an assessment. And then, of course, you will, you want to have this checked by a professional. That's not the point. The point is really to have a cheap way of getting high of, of classifying high throughput data. And then, in yeah. the end, of course, when you say, okay, that, I think this is cancer genius, please see a doctor and do it now. Don't do yeah. it in yeah. two years when it's too late. Right. Do it now. And the the impact on people's lives. Uh, is especially in healthcare is huge, but also in business, um, even if it might not be that as heroic as in, in healthcare, right. it's of course still good if you if you can reduce waste, um, if you can um, right. can react quicker on damages, on, on defects, on problems. Um, you're, you're reducing your waste and you're reducing, well, both of material and resources and money, uh, and that, that's good for all of us. So tell us a little bit, how does it work under the hood, right? With um, AI models or these neural networks, you typically model these and with layers kind of a thing, right? And so with quantum computing, we're dealing with uh, circuits and gates. So how do you model such a kind of a neural network if you want to use it with QML? Yes. Um, so what, what we have been uh, using so far are hybrid architectures. So we are marrying uh, the advantages of a classical computer with the advantages of a quantum computer. And as you said correctly, um, a neural network is organized in layers. Uh, so at, at the beginning, you have these huge images, say it's 2,000 something times 2,000 pixels. That's a lot of data, which you cannot put on a quantum computer. Quantum computers are not that big at the moment. Um, so uh, what these classical neural networks are really good at is uh, extracting these features and uh, and modeling more complex features. So at the beginning, they might just see an edge and they might just see uh, a shadow and they might, they might just see something something is pointy. And then um, they they out of these basic features, they create more complex ones. This is a this is something round. This is an eye. This is a nose. This is a face. So it becomes ever more complex. So you arrive at more useful features. And that's why convolutional neural networks are really good for image classification. Um, however, at the, uh, at the end, say, or towards the end, um, what we can do is we can we can cut this neural network and we can insert a quantum layer. Now, um, out of these 2,000 times 2,000 pixels, which are all data which you have to, to work with, um, after all these feature extraction, you might end up with, with very few data, maybe 200, maybe 100. Um, and this becomes much more manageable. Uh, current quantum computers have something between, well, say, a couple of qubits to 
30, 20 qubits. Um, there are some quantum computers which have more, like 60, 70 from Google. However, they are also noisy, so you cannot use all of them. But something between, I would say, 10 and 20 is definitely a usable uh, number currently for quantum computers. So if we are managing to use a classical neural network to reduce uh, these data to this number, say 10, um, we can actually put this on a quantum computer, and this was this is what we have been doing. Um, so we um, we have we have benchmarked also that even uh, four or six qubits is already quite nice, and you get good results. So you put this on on your qubits, and then as you said, you are in different worlds, the quantum world, which is programmed with uh, with gates, and you're not destroying your information. You're always keeping all the information until the end of your your computation. It's a probabilistic calculation, so it's a different world. But it turns out that the way we have set up these gates, and in which we have um, which you make the quantum information flow through this this quantum pipeline, um, we are creating some you say in, in physics entanglement, so some correlations, some some relation between the various uh, data points. And uh, somehow, and this is an interesting question because I would say we haven't really understood yet why this is working so well, somehow this, um, this, this space, this quantum space allows a better representation uh, of the data. And then at the end of this, this circuit, we are measuring, it's, a, it's again a technical term, so we are looking at what, what has the quantum circuit made out of this quantum information. We are putting it again into a classical register and then we can um, we can make our classification, and uh, and, and this is interesting because it, it's really marrying um, the the as I said before the advantages of what we have learned how convolutional neural networks work and what they are really good at with what we have seen also in other quantum machine learning algorithms um, on data representation. So yeah, there's a, a better way of representing uh, your data. And you can even do it in on uh, today's quantum computers. And this is super exciting because for a lot of tasks, um, which you might have heard of, like prime like uh, prime factorization of big numbers and breaking RSA algorithm, you need big computers, right? It's nothing which you, can, which you really need to be afraid of right now uh, or which you can do right now. Also molecular simulation, all the big things that quantum computers are going to do in the coming, let's say, three to five years, um, the quantum machine learning is something you can do right now. And um, that is, of course, something we are interested in. What can we do right now with this toy? That's that's awesome. And be before I ask you about some of the uh, scenarios and some, sharing some examples, um, could it be like, you know, it's a little bit phys philosophical angle to the question, but like, you know, with quantum, uh, we're going down to the smallest dimension, how our universe, not dimension, but to the smallest scale, how our yes. universe works, right? And so we have this uncertainty and, uh, you know, these kind of, uh, you know, randomness and all of that occurs. So basically our world works on analog data, right? I mean, it's all analog. We cannot exactly yes. say, okay, it's a particle right there or is it a little bit there, right? This kind of Heisenberg, uh, what Heisenberg discovered, basically. But uh, is it, could it be like, because we get better results already with the, even with these small quantum computers, but leveraging QML, because we can represent the data and not just in a digital way, but more in an, a closer to nature, if you will, like in an analog stage kind of a thing. That is an, a very interesting question. And uh, I think this is what the community needs to work on right now to really understand a bit better what this this quantum layers are are doing. Why is it so much, well, not so much better, but why, why is it seem, does it seem to be a better representation? And in which yeah. cases does it, does it seem to be a better representation? So um, in general, what you say is, is right, that um, if you... If you see that your data is is uh, quantum in origin, you have a quantum sensor, for instance, um, yeah. then then it's much it performs much better. If mm -hmm. you see that it's um, it's uh, it's sensor data in general, um, we see a, a better performance of or a better enhancement, a, a richer enhancement of these quantum representations. And to be very honest with you. It is it is something which I do not know, and I don't think anybody really knows uh, what exactly is happening in there, which makes it more um, more suitable uh, than for very artificial data. We still see an advantage, but it's not as pronounced. And I, I like your philosophical angle because it really guides the way uh, to to better usage of the models, also also technically and in, from an engineering perspective. If we understand better what the representation really is and what features we need, um, we will also get. Uh, we, we, yeah, we can we can also design these these models better in the future, but this is really an active research field, um, and we are, yeah we are trying to do our contribution by um, looking at applied situations and and saying okay look here it works well here it works also well but maybe not as well um, what is the difference and can we learn something on on real data sets that that's what yeah. we are interested in. 
Can, can you share maybe some examples what, what you're doing in that field and what Reply is doing in this area? Yes. So we, um, in, in order to, to get this innovation going, what we usually do is we look at, at research papers and uh, we are doing our own experiments, right? So um, already uh, two years ago, we looked at more classic uh, algorithms for machine learning and tried to do them to enhance them with quantum uh, computing. And uh, last year, we started with neural networks. And it turned out that we kind of um, hit, hit a, a good point there because um, later this year, the second half of this year, um, BMW and AWS post a challenge in which we took part. And I'm, I'm happy to, to say that we reached the final of this challenge. Nice. And um, yeah, it was really nice. And, and we, we used this knowledge which we gained there on a, um, yeah, on, a, on a task of, say, quality control in manufacturing. Um, and we have we have looked at, an, at a data set uh, which was provided there. Um, it's actually a public data set. So, um, but uh, nevertheless, it was interesting to see what what is relevant to to the client there. And uh, what what we really saw is that uh, that the point we discussed earlier, um, having millions of images available, is not a realistic scenario. Um, especially there, you. you yeah, you don't produce millions of car defects, uh, luckily. So um, you uh, you you really need to to battle this uh, this data scarcity uh, problem. Um, so we we tried to come up with a um, with a setup uh, again, um, taking inspiration from our experience in machine learning and taking some of our knowledge uh, which we gained by experimenting with with quantum computing, and tried to come up with a model which is in particular um, solving this this data scarcity. Um, setup. But maybe what I should say is that, uh, I mean, we didn't start this uh, this research because we wanted to, um, we had a specific use case in mind. We, we were fascinated about um, the, the perspective to improve uh, neural networks as a general method of machine learning. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the thing which is really striking me, apart from the fact that you can use it right now already with the current quantum computers, is that neural networks are a pretty universal tool. You can use it on images, which is what we are talking about, and where we see, where we have um, real experience and hands-on experience now. But you can also use it for language. You can use it for structured data. You can use it for all kinds of, uh, in all kinds of settings. And also neural networks are still being developed. So uh, what, what I, I really enjoy about this journey is um, that we have yet to see in which other fields and which other applications we'll see these advantages of, uh, of quantum enhancement, uh, enhancement of the feature representation by quantum computing um, and see if we can get better results in other uh, or, or more useful results in other areas as well. Again, I don't have any hands-on experience at, at the moment um, because now we are, we are dealing with images, but uh, I just wanted to put this out there. There's a much broader uh, range yeah. of applications and that's, that's really fascinating and uh, an interesting prospect. Uh, well, exciting times. And unfortunately, we're already at the end of the show. Uh, we could talk for, for many more hours about this. And I'm sure we will invite you again. And maybe you can share us some of the results from the BMW challenge and also the other research you're doing with QML uh, for image classification, but also for NLP, uh, natural language processing, a couple of those. Again, those thank you so much. Steps, yeah. Th yeah, thank, thank, thank you, you so Remy. much. Alrighty, uh, and thanks everyone for joining us for another episode of Qubytes, your bite-sized pieces of quantum computing. Um, watch our blog, follow our social media channels to hear all about the next episodes of season four already. Yes, season four. And of course, um, if you missed any of the previous seasons or episodes from those, you can always go to valorenreply.com, uh, watch all the episodes there from season one to four. Take care, see you soon. Bye-bye.